Um, guys, I think we'll make a, make a start because I'm, I'm cognizant of your time and I know people have travelled to get here and <coughs> I'm, uh, I'm a bit of a stickler for time and in particular when you're dealing with volunteers where you're trying to manage family, jobs and as well as your coaching. So rather than sit around and wait for five minutes for people that aren't going to come to arrive, we'll, I think we'll make a start. Um, for those that don't know me, my name's Peter Lonigan. I work with Basketball Australia in the high performance coach development area. Um, and tonight we're going to talk about uh, how we as coaches can support athletes with their, their well-being. Uh, obviously, in the current climate, it's a, it's a major issue and it's a major part of our society. Um, how, you know, the troubles that with mental health and, and well-being that not only young athletes are having, but people in all, all walks of life. So we're not, I'm not here as a healthcare professional. I don't profess to, to have any great expertise in this area. Uh, what I do profess to, to have is a willingness to have a conversation and, and to, to spark some thought about how we as a coaching cohort can have a positive impact uh, on athletes' lives and can play a role in their overall well-being. You know, obviously we want the healthcare professionals to do their role, what they're trained to do, what they've studied to do, but we certainly can play, play a role in, in making sure that our athletes, whether they're junior athletes or even those ones that are coaching senior athletes, um, are happy um, and that they're, they're well. You know, they're well physically and, and they're well emotionally. And I think that's a, that's a really important part of the conversation. So rather than me stand here and talk for, for 90 minutes, I think it's important that this is a conversation. And that's one word that you'll hear a lot of in the next hour or so, conversation, because that's coaching and that's dealing with people and that's leadership. So either in your notes, if you've got pad and paper, just, just answer, answer those two questions. Why do you coach? And it doesn't have, you don't have to go into a long spiel about it. Why do you coach? And then what's important to you as a coach? Now that might be defensive containment, closeout technique. And that's okay, right? If it's an X's and O's type thing. But think about the non-coaching aspects of coaching. What's important to you as a coach or a leader in terms of the athlete as well, all right? And the reason I want you to write it down is obviously embed that, that thought price a, a little bit. And as you ponder those two questions, I'll give you a third one that's not up there. Why did you start coaching? Now that might be as simple as, oh, my little sister was playing in the under 12s and they didn't have a coach. That's okay too. It doesn't have to be an earth chattering answer, but why did you start coaching? With those questions, why do you coach? Whose answer, just a quick show of hands, was about people? Pretty much everyone in the room, right? So what does that indicate that coaching is about? It's about people. And you think, well, you know, you don't need to fly from the East Coast to tell us that. We're not fools. But it's a big one now in modern coaching. You don't coach basketball. There's no one in this room that coaches basketball. You don't coach players. You coach people that do those other things. You coach people who are players that play basketball. All right? And I think that's a really important framework for your thought process about how you are... Coaching now is much more about the individual and relationships than it ever has been. I'm 50 this year. When I, when I started playing, whatever sport it was, it was my way or the highway. Coach said, do it, that's what you would do. When do you reckon it changed? 
probably generationally. Yeah, I don't know, but it's certainly not that way anymore. And that way, for the most part, is seen as antiquated and old-fashioned and whatever else. We teed this up before the session. I 100% agree. Yeah, well, and I think what we're talking about, and you're dead right, and I'm glad you, and I'm quite serious, I'm glad you brought that up. The My Way of the Highway coaching, when I first started playing, and, and you know, other people in this room was dictatorial, um, very inflexible, and it often was permeated with loud voices and aggressive and overt and whatever else. There is less of that. There is less of that in general terms. Now, there's still some ugliness there. But the my way of the highway still does exist where people are still inflexible. They might yell less, they might jump up and down on the sideline less, but they're still every bit as inflexible and they're still every bit coaching basketball rather than coaching people. And that's why we want to that's where we want to get to. Doesn't mean that coaching is now we join hands and sing kumbaya holding, being accountable, and, and all those things are still important, particularly as you go up, go up levels. But... Doesn't that 100%. Yeah, and that's why he's seen as a doyen of, of coaching, but um, research indicates that people that people do coach how they were coached. And it's strange because they coach how they were coached more than coach from their personality. You know, many years ago, my coaching mentor um, is American. I was going to say was American. He's still with us, so he still is American. And he was a yeller and a screamer. He's from that collegiate thing. And so that's why, well, that's how you coach. We were really good teams. We, he was a really good coach. Um, so I thought, well, that's what you do. So I started doing that, yelling, screaming, jumping up on the sideline, into officials, da-da-da. And my partner at the time said, how come when you coach, you're this personality and all the rest of the time you were that? I went, I don't know. I would have liked to argue, but that would have been being not my personality, you know. And it was a really watershed moment. For, why am I coaching from outside my personality? And it's a common thing. You know, I spent a lot of time in, in the 90s and the early 2000s in, in and around Melbourne and there was a whole host of, of coaches that not only tried to coach like the great Brian Gorge, they tried to walk like him too. You see these guys, you know, they're, they're, that's, not, that's how he walks, that's not how you walk. But they were so fixated on being someone else that was at a high level that they forgot to be themselves. So as I, as I was framing this, and I got a lot of advice from, um, from different people about how we should approach this, because it's been a bit of a taboo subject. We're talking about it today. A lot of coaches said, hey, I'm not a healthcare professional. That, that's nothing to do with me. I just coach the kids. Right? And they're actually coming from a good place in a sense that they're thinking, well, I don't have the formal skills to impact this. No one's asking you to. Right? We're asking you to, to help these young people or even you know, senior players navigate through being an athlete and the stresses and the pressures that come with that. So someone asked me, what's the three most important things in coaching for you? And those are the three that came up just writing down on a pad straight away. And they said, well, just frame everything around that then. So mine was create a caring and learning environment Know your players, relationships. The, the, the biggest buzz for me as a coach, and I don't profess to be a great one, is the relationships with players. Reese Carter just not long ago retired and, and I rang him and we spoke for an hour and a half. It was the coolest thing. I coached him when he was 16 years old. Uh, another player of mine's retiring this weekend in the, in the Siebel Grand Finals. And, and again, I rang him, we just spoke for an hour and it was really cool. 
that's, to me, that's really, really important, those relationships. And I haven't coached those guys for 15 years. And then building a community. I don't mean a community like Mandra. I don't mean a community like down the road where there's a new housing estate. When we talk about coaching, the, build, the community I want to build is the team, the coaching staff, the parents, the managers, and everyone that's around it. So everyone involved with the team feels like they're part of something bigger than themselves. But again, everything's got to be focused about the players. So if we can create a community feel that everyone feels they're part of something special, they're part of something bigger than themselves, that's fantastic for players because they feel safe. They feel valued. These are words that we use a lot more now in society, which is fantastic, than we did 10 years ago, particularly for us bullfed males in the room. We didn't like to use the word care. We didn't like to ask people if they felt safe. We didn't, tell, we didn't like to tell them that we we're proud of them. It's not what you do as an Anglo-Saxon Australian male, right? We do it now, which is a lot better. It's got a long way to go. So they were the three things for me, and it was a really good exercise to get done. And I encourage you to go through, what, what are your three key elements? I spoke to some young coaches uh, in Italy uh, about three weeks ago, a friend of mine runs a club and they asked me to speak to some young coaches and I said, what's the two most important things for you as a coach? Defensive transition, pick and roll defense, spacing, shooting, developing an elite skill. There was, there was 26 we wrote down. Not one of them had, to got, had anything to do with people. Now, these guys were 23 to... 30-year-old coaches on a path, really ambitious, really not one answer pertained to the person. Doesn't make them wrong, but I said to my mate, you got some problems. As a club, as a community, you would hope that out of 20-plus coaches, someone touches on the importance of well-being and the individual. This is um, some questions for you to answer again. Um, think about this. Your last practice session when you were going, and I know most of you, are unlike me, you've got a real job. I'm lucky I don't have a real job. I get to do this for a living. It's fantastic. Right? But how many of you are walking into the stadium, walking to the court, answering that last work email, flicking that last text message, or doing something on your phone. Anyone was doing that? How many times have you walked onto the training court, engaged in something else than where your feet are? You think, well, what's the big problem? Who's usually the first people at practice, particularly for you guys who you've all got jobs and you're racing from different things? You get to practice, who's there? Kids. You know, there's kids there because they've ridden their bike or they've got their early mum and dad have dropped them off or whatever else. So they're there. Who's the most important people in all of, all of sport? Athlete-focused, coach-driven, administrator-supported. That's how you should run sport. Athlete-focused, coach-driven, administrator-supported. All important roles, but who's first? So are you where you, when you arrive at practice, are you where your feet are? Or are you worried about what's going on at home, what's going on at work? Are you flicking that last email? Are you sending that last text message? If you're doing that, you're not a bad person. But can we make a subtle change? I now, when I, when I do clinics and, and run sessions, I, I purposely leave my phone in the car because I don't want to walk into the stadium at... at at Joondal Loop and be on the phone like I'm big time important. I want to walk in there and be getting eyeballs of kids and other coaches and parents. I'm here, this is where I'm at. I'm, I'm here where my feet are and for the next period of time, you're my focus. 
when you get to practice, if you're lucky enough to have an assistant, do you go to the assistant coach first or do you bypass and do you go to players first? Just think about what you do. Why do you think it's important to go to player, a player first and have some sort of flight path communication rather than go straight to your coaching staff? Any ideas? Exactly, right? You're also unwittingly creating a hierarchy. So I get to practice, Greg's my assistant, kids are there, and you know what they're doing, they're shooting three-point shots. You'd love to them to be you know, doing mic and drill and whatever else, but they're not, they're shooting 30-footers, right? You look at them and go, oh God, these kids drive me insane. So you go over to the coach, you start talking. So unwittingly, you've created a hierarchy. It's Greg and I, and you guys. Now, who would ever want to do that? No, of course you don't. And it's not something that you might say, oh, you give the kids too much credit. My thing is you don't give, we don't give kids and players credit enough. Right? So it's just subtle changes. How long does it take you to ask an athlete a question on arriving at training of the game? Do you do it? How long does it take you to engage an athlete when you get to practice or at a, at a game? And the question can be anything. We've got that great question in our language. How you going? All right? How was school? Hey, you had that camp. And again, this is not about being warm and fuzzy. This is about two things. It's about managing the well-being of your players, but it's about a performance outcome. I work in the high performance area and it's a big buzz term. You can have that money, but what's the performance outcome going to be? Right? Well, the performance outcome of happier players, players that feel cared for, players that feel safe, that, that's a performance outcome. That's going to help you perform better. That's going to help you win games. If that's your thing, invest in this space. In 2006, I was fortunate enough to be with the Australian Opals at the World Championships. We won the gold medal. The championships was in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Penny Taylor was the most valuable player of the tournament. And for that two weeks, she was the best female basketball player on the planet, bar none. Sao Paulo, Brazil also happened to be the home of her husband, where they owned a house and they owned a pub, believe it or not. She felt really safe, cared for, she liked the environment. And she played the two weeks, like just unbelievable basketball. And it was a great learning curve for me. Did I know Penny was a phenomenal player? Of course I did. But then when I started to see her interacting, talking in Portuguese to other people and seeing, fa oh, that's why. That's why she went from being pretty good to special. Next time you're going at a practice or a game, can you answer this with clear conscience? Now you might say, well, that's easy for you. I've got a job, I've got a family, I'm trying to do this, I'm coaching, I don't get paid. You know, I've got other things going on in my world. But for that hour and a half, are you where your feet are? Because who's going to know? The players are going to know. They are going to know if you're distracted. And I don't mean distracted like you're on your phone or you look, but they'll get a sense that, oh, I don't know if he's, he's right here with us right now or she's right here with us right now. And I think that's a huge, a huge one. All right? The boomers are practicing here at the moment. They're playing on Friday night. They spend a disproportionate amount of time making sure that they do this. Luke Longley, great Western Australian, he's the assistant coach of the national team. It's the first coaching role he's ever had. Say that out loud to yourself. He's the assistant coach of the national team. It's the first coaching role he's ever had. And it's not because he won championships with the NBA. It's because of his ability to be here and to the relationships these high-level relationships. There's a huge investment 
in that. He doesn't profess to know the latest offense with a turnout cut into a handoff, into a flare screen, middle pick and roll finish. He doesn't profess to know that. But he's really crucial because of his relationships and his genuine care. All right, so I think that's, you know, if that can be invested there at that level, we need to do it at the junior level. Okay. Player welfare starts with the physical as well, of course, having realistic expectations. What else are they doing? Do you know what else your players are doing? Do you know if they're playing other sports, when that other sport is for training, you know, what the, what the key periods of time are? Do you know what they're doing in their school programs? Have you got a diary? Do you know when they've got peak periods? That's your responsibility because tired players usually are unhappy players. Fatigued players don't feel safe. So these are the things that we have to make sure that we manage. All right, what else did they do today? And this comes back to that coaching, my way or the highway. For years, and we were just talking about this before we started, you know, sometimes I think you've got to give players a bake. You've got to, you've got to give them a bit of a, you know, you've got to rev them a little bit. But not if you don't know what else they've done today. Have they had an athletics carnival where there's big pressure from their school to be in every event? And it happens. It doesn't mean the school's doing the wrong thing, but they, oh, we've got the best athlete. We've got to get this guy to, I don't know what system they have in WA, but in ACT they have regionals. So they split ACT in half and then they have state and then you, you go off to bigger events. So there's pressure from the best athletes to do all these events. Have they, what have they done that day? Seek advice from healthcare professionals. This is a big one. If a kid comes to you and they say they're injured and they've got, you know, a, a letter from their physio or they've got, you know, some sort of certificate, end of conversation. End of conversation. The days of that, of the tough player being playing through injury, the days of, oh, yeah, but that's fine. We've got a final this weekend. We're playing Sterling. Then you can have four weeks off. Just, you know. It's, it's over. You can't do that. You can't do it legally because, you, you know, it's a real no-no in terms of member protection. But the pressure that you're putting on, and I, when I say kids, I'm old. Everyone's a kid that, play, that still plays sport, <laughs> right? You, the pressure you're putting on kids is tremendous. They feel an obligation to you. They feel an obligation to their team. They might feel an obligation to the club, their parents, granddad who played 450 games for Mandurah. You just don't know. Right? Mate, you reckon you can go? Just one game. And we get up by 20, I'll, I'll take you out. What's that 15-year-old what's that going to say? No, I think in... Overall, with my welfare, my decision is not to play. Thanks, coach. They don't have the ability to do that. One, there's a hierarchy. Two, they don't want to let you down. Right? So as soon as you know that, end of conversation. Be the adult. The young athlete will want to do it all. You've got to be the adult. One of the biggest problems we've got in our country in youth sport now is workload. Kids are in school programs, they're in their club programs, they're in a rep program, they're in a state program, maybe they're even in an academy program with the Lynx or the Wildcats or whatever. You know, the kids are in four or five different things and they may have five, we, we had an example in Sydney, a young man that we're trying to bring to the Centre of Excellence has got seven basketball coaches, seven. Seven messages, seven inadvertent stresses, requirements, obligations. None of those seven guys bad people, I'm sure. I don't know all seven. I know some of them. But seven. How would you like to have seven bosses? 
Who said this in the workplace under their breath? Oh, how many bosses have I got? Oh, you're my boss now, are you? I say it all the time. All right? Stakeholders. It's a fancy way to say bosses. <laughs> so this is what's going on. So you've got to be the adult. Who's, go who's going to give ground? That's what someone asked me a couple of weeks ago on this same thing. Oh, I'm always the one to give ground. Oh, sorry. Say that out loud to yourself. You're talking about a 15-year-old athlete. Why am I always the one to give ground? I don't know, man. Sorry that it's so affronting for you that you're making a decision that's for the good of this 15-year-old child. I say this all the time. Say it out loud to yourself. When people Say that out loud to yourself and then listen. Why am I the one always giving ground with this 15? Oh, yeah, you're right. You know, that's, that's what we have to have more people willing to be the adults. And I know it's hard. I know it, it's challenging. It's challenging for me in my job. Most of you, it's challenging for you as volunteers because you're investing so much in. But the stresses that that's creating for young people and players is tremendous. Right? Most kids are compliant. Sure, we've got some some parents in the room that might roll their right, but, but in a most kids are compliant. They want to do what? Please. You put them in a sporting environment, what do they certainly want to do? Please. Who? You. Mum, dad, grandpa that played 450 games. They want to please. So there's nothing, you might say, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, there is if it's creating further stresses and it's creating unrealistic expectations for them. And this is the big one. Have more conversations with players. Score out of five now. Score out of five. I want you to write down or put it in your phone. How would you rate the level of conversation you are currently having with your players? Very broad question. Just try and think about an answer to that and then we'll unpack it. How would you rate, score out of five, the level of conversations you're currently having with your players? Hands up who's had a practice session or a game in the last 10 days. Hands up if you didn't have a conversation with a player in that game or practice. Now, think. Not, Greg, move your feet defensively, keep your hands out. That's not a conversation, it's an instruction. Did you ask them a question? Did you listen to the answer? Did you give them affirmation on that answer? Did you talk about something other than their jump shot, their back cut? they're boxing out. Now, hands up who didn't have a conversation with a player in the last 10 days in that setting. Pretty good. And it's not meant to be confronting. It's not meant to be a confronting question, but there, I've gone through all this because I don't want to roll this out nationally and be talking out the side of my mouth. I, you know, I'm a professional coach, so I don't want to be standing up and say, do this, and then thinking, oh, God. All right? So these are the questions that you have to do, but this is a big one. This is modern coaching, more conversations. All right? Find energy to have more conversations. So mental well-being is a very, very challenging space, and it can be a very intimidating space. Right. We all see the horror stories uh, in the media about high-profile high athletes. Um, you know, we're having more conversations about, but it's confronting and it's something that intimidates a lot of coaches. How do we impact it? We're not healthcare professionals. Have more conversations. How's school? Right? How was water polo? How's that going? Right? Now, if they're playing another sport, how's footy going? 
Do you win on the weekend? Are they playing you forward or what? Now, initially, kids would be like, oh, he's trying to trick me. He doesn't want me to play football, so he's trying to play with them. They will because they've established a hierarchy too. But have a genuine interest. Find out how they went. Get on the website, see how Claremont went in the under-17s. Oh, so you kick three. Do you have a handball? Right. It's flight path. It takes 20 seconds to do, but now it's a relationship. It's not a hierarchy. Yes, he knows that I'm the coach. He knows that, that what I say in this session goes in terms of how we're going to manage performance. But he also knows that we're doing it together now rather than a lecture-based environment. It takes 20 seconds on your phone to just do a little bit of research. And I don't mean jump on their Facebook page, don't go down that murky swamp, all right? But know what they're doing, know when they're doing it, within reason, and show some genuine interest. One of the things that sport, professional sport does now so much better is families. Families go on the road. Families are welcome at practice. You know, it's not, it's not seen to be, you know, a, a, such an environment where, no, well, you've got to pick. So flight path coaching, what I mean by that is, is less meetings, more questions, and the soundbite generation. This, group, this generation doesn't listen to a whole song. Who's got teenage kids? Anyone? They listen to this, and sometimes they, they get you to put their, their iPod in your car, right? And so you listen to a song and you hate the first song, but you don't have to worry because they're only going to listen to about a third of it and then they're going to go to the next song. They don't listen to full songs. They go on to the next thing, right? Why has Facebook been so popular, right? It's an algorithm. Part of it, it connects with your brain to want you to go to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. The average click length on Facebook is like 4.4 seconds but the average visit to Facebook is 6.2 minutes. Do the maths. We're on to the next thing. We're on to the next thing. Just, oh, what's this mean? Oh, what's that over there? It's not lack of, people say, oh, it's lack of attention span. It's actually the opposite. It's your ability to give your attention to so many different things. That's the, that's the soundbite generation. That's who you're coaching. They don't want meetings. Greg just retired. Greg, how many times... Did you say, hey guys, we've got a meeting next? Fantastic. Right? If the coach said to you, hey, can we meet? Did you go, oh good, we're meeting. It's not, it's not the connotation, the boss says, hey, can you come into my office? You don't go, yeah, bro. I'm, you're walking in there thinking what? Phew, here we go. I can't believe he knew that I took that toilet roll. But less meetings, more flight, get across their flight path a bit more. Right? And what I mean by that is Mick Poulton, who is a, is a performance uh, coach in the AFL, Gold Coast Suns have got really young players, They've got a really young list. They train at an oval and then they walk from here to probably just outside that wall to their um, performance centre where they do weights, they eat, they have meetings and whatever. So it's a walk, maybe even a bit further, maybe from that court there. They've got, you know, in the AFL, they've got more coaches than Telstra has employees. So what they do is every coach has to get past the flight path of a player. So as they're walking to the ground, they just, Dave, how you going? How was that? Good? How's the legs? Good. All right. How's the little one? Still teething? Yep. And it's just a two-minute flight path conversation. I think you guys called it daily vitamins with the Wildcats, same sort of thing. It's a structured, informal environment. And what they do is then they go back and they write down. So Peter Lonigan uh, had a flight path with Dave. The next day, I don't go to Dave because we don't want it to be contrived. We don't want him to think that this is a structured environment. We, do, we want him to think slash know that it's a genuine interest. And they monitor it. And at the end of the month, they go, you know what? Dave's been down. Yeah, he was down when I spoke to him too. And it might be just that the little one's teething. What can we do for Dave? Probably not much. But we can be aware of it. We can show him some empathy. And you know what? When his wife comes to the club, we can make sure we're across that as well. 
Because if she, she's happy, he's ha- you know, now we're impacting well-being and do we need to be psychologists? No. Do we need to have a six-year degree to do this? No. We're just getting it past people's flight path. You know, you should do it, if you're a manager, do it with your staff. Less meetings, more opportunities just to have a soundbite conversation. If you see it or, or sense it, act. Everyone understand what I mean by that? Uh, just, Luke just don't, that's like the second week in a row, he just seems a bit off. Do something. What can you do? Luke's come to practice Tuesday, really quiet, unlike him. Come Thursday, maybe he's bitten at one of his teammates a little bit, really unlike him. Twice in one week, you've se- you, you sensed it or you saw it on Tuesday, now you sense it and you saw it again on Thursday. What can you do? What would be some examples of what you can do in that setting? Don't ignore it. Yep, don't ignore it. Act. First one, right? Great. But how? Good question. Yep. 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 It can just, just be that, right? It can just be that. Just start a conversation. Right? Now, 10 years ago, I said, man, what's up your ass? And that would be my way of trying, you know, a bit of fun, but not helpful. <laughs> right? Hierarchy, you know, whatever else. You might go, if he's got a really close friend in the team, I might say, hey, Dave, Luke okay? Yeah, he just broke up with his girlfriend. Oh, man. I don't think, hey, man, I heard about your girlfriend. Oh, yeah, I know now. And I might decide to do what? Nothing. Because, okay, well, I'll give it another. If then he comes on to the game Sunday and he's still down, what else can I do? Who else is involved in his life? Parents. And I've said it in this room before. I, I hear young coaches say all the time, hey, I coach the kids. I don't coach the parents. I don't deal with parents. Good luck, bro. Good luck. I've coached in the WNBL, dealt with parents. I've been at an Olympic Games on a coaching staff, dealing with parents. So if you think that, you know, these guys, oh, I don't deal with parents, I coach a kid. No, they're a really, really important part. You've got to have a relationship so you can go to the parents. And there's a risk, isn't it? This is where people don't do it. You can't get a handle of it. So I go to Luke's dad and say, Jeff, Luke's been a bit off the last couple of practices. Has he not been himself? Has that been the same at home? What's the risk? What's the risk? What can the response be by his father that would make it uncomfortable for us? Yeah, that's none of your business. So you know what? We shouldn't do it. Are you kidding? That's the worst thing that could happen he can say, hey, that's none of your business. All right? Now it comes down to your personality. Yep. Go the other way. And this happens. They get angry at the other kid. Yep. So you create trouble for the kid. Yep. That's the wrong thing. Yep. Cost benefit, though? Yeah, sure. Cost benefit. This what, you know, you're dead right. There's a whole lot of things that can... It can per- but cost benefit. We were dealing with a situation for, for a young... Uh, indigenous uh, athlete um, not long ago and I rang a good friend of mine and said this is happening but I don't want to overstep the mark and I, you know, I don't want to ring the parent because it's really none of my business and you know, this guy's one of the, the brightest guys I know he goes um, if that was a, an Anglo parent would you be asking me that question? I go, hey, man, come on now. What, what are you saying to me? He goes, I'm just asking you a question. I know what he was saying to me, but he was just asking me a question. I go, shut up, hung up, rang the parent. And it went great. It went great. We solved what we thought was Mount Vesuvius. It was a little problem like this. Away we go. Right? It was a great learning for me. What, what's the worst that can happen? All right. Well, the worst that can happen is something that none of us in this room want to think about. 
That's the worst that can happen to a person, who, a young person who's unwell, unhappy, doesn't feel safe, doesn't, doesn't see anything, a solution moving forward. That's the worst that can happen. So, you know, if you're a coach, you put your hand up to risk an uncomfortable conversation. You've got, we say to the players all the time, you've got to be a little bit comfortable being uncomfortable. It's a very common coaching thing. Yeah, well, the, the duty of care, yeah, it, it is grey because it, once you get into that, there's, there's legal issues, there's member protection legislation, both in terms of state, nationally, the state body has its member protection legislation, right? Um, so it is murky, and that's what I'm saying. While all that stuff's important and it underpins some really important areas, just have the conversation. You don't, you don't need to do a lot of research to go, you know what, there's just something not right. Can we have a chat? Whether that's the person or whether that's, whether that's the, the parent. And I'm not glazing over that, I, but there's, there's certainly structure there in terms of what duty of care is for a coach, documentation. My thing is, let's dumb it down. Just have the conversation. Be brave and, and play a key role in this. Now everyone's thinking, God, man, I'm just, I work in a bank 65 hours a week and now you want me to take this on? Guess what? Yeah. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. All right? It's important. All right? Letting players know it's okay to speak about their problems. Some of the really cool stuff at the moment with the player's voice, you probably would have seen Liz Cambridge came out really heartfelt um, article of recent. There's been a lot of people that have done it. Greg's driven a lot of terrific stuff in the space. It's just more conversation. But let people know it's okay because sport's about toughness and resilience. Right? You've got to be gritty. All, all these things. I just finished that book, Grit. And at the end of it, I thought, I don't like this book. I'm sure she doesn't care. She's made like $35 million out of selling it. But Because, you know, all those things are important. Grit, resilience, toughness. You've got to be able to, you've got to, be able to handle that. But it's also okay to say, hey, I'm struggling. It's okay, coach, I'm, I'm really struggling with this. Now, I'm not, lec I'm not lecturing you from a societal point of view. This is strictly from a coaching point of view. I don't have the skills to get up here and lecture you from a societal point of view. This is coaching in the modern era. Landscape, exams, study pressure, other stresses. Sometimes if you just know, you can manage it easy. And it doesn't mean, you know, if someone's unhappy and then you find out it's exam time, you go, oh, it's just exams. But you know what? It might be just exams. How are you going to know? Next time you see them, get across their flight path again. If they're okay, well, it probably was just exams. You know what I mean? Like, we're not asking people to delve in and, and psychoanalyze people. We, we're asking just to be a, know the landscape. And we spoke about community. Involve the staff. Everyone's got a role in the welfare piece. Who's got, who's got an assistant coach? Anyone? All right. You've got to engage them. You've got to have this conversation. Manager, you've got to have this conversation. Anyone who's around the team, they've got a responsibility. You spoke about duty of care. Everyone's got a responsibility, right? They need to be educated. They need to, to do this stuff. It's really important. And I put that photo there because that, enca that encapsulates Luke. Look at him. That's what Luke does. If you were to watch practice today and the next two days, you would just see him walking around and like, it's a great Australian trait, isn't it? He'll just, you know, sidle up to someone. They're, he's sort of even talking out of his mouth and you'll see, the, you'll see the guy go, yeah. You'll just see the affirmation and then he'll just walk off to the next guy. Now, sometimes it's about, hey, good shot. Way to step into that three. I'm not suggesting he, he's not a basketball coach. Of course he is. But he just gets around, and I would, if you were to chart it, he probably has 30 or 40 flight path engagements of practice. 30 or 40. How many, if you're an assistant yourself, how many are you having? Right? And again, it's not all about 
it, a lot of it's going to be about basketball. But on the, one of the previous slides, how do you spell love? T-I-M-E. Corny? People say, God, that's corny. Right? That's half the problem. Right? We write it, it's corny. I'm proud of you. Oh, it's corny. I care for you. It's corny. The best coaches use those terms all the time. They use them all the time. Not as a throwaway line, they use them all the time. All right? Mick Malthouse, legend in these parts. Scary dude. Angry dude. People that play for him, you know, there's a genuine affection. Both ways. Genuine affection. All right? So if that's at that level where there's so much pressure, we've got to be able to establish that as well. Right, what can coaches do? Oh, there it is again. More conversations. Find energy to touch base. Find energy is a big one in this space. Who has to go often from work straight to their practice session? Changing in the car, whatever, scribbling a practice. Yeah, we've all been there. We've all been there. Who's had to drop kids, their own, your own kids, off at other stadiums, other sports, other events to go and coach other people's kids, do that, get back in the car, go get your kid. Yes? Right? So it's, when I say find energy to touch base, it's hard to find energy. Sometimes it's, the energy is just to get on the court and go, all right, four lines on the baseline. We've all been there. Right? But you you know, you can't, you've got to be where your feet are. So you've got to find energy to have those conversations. Uh, involve the families. They're going to want to be part of it. Now, we spoke about the risk factor. None of your business. You're overstepping the mark. Don't tell me how to parent my child. I've been told all those things. I've been told all those things five times as much in the last 18 months since we've started to invest in this than I was in 20 years of coaching before. Am I offended? No, I'm the opposite. Good. Because I know we're having conversations. And the wins, the success stories, more than overcome some stubborn guy who, for whatever reason, doesn't want to allow you in. And that's okay. doesn't make that person a bad person. All right? But involve the families. How can you devote time to well-being management? What's some things that you can do? Okay, I'll ask a different question. Do you manage the well-being, the happiness, the safety of your players differently now than you did 10 years ago or when you first started coaching? Yeah. So you've made an investment already. You're making an investment tonight. Hopefully, it's, it's, a, it's a worthwhile investment tonight of your time. But when I say devote time to well-being management, it's just a fancy way to say devote time to make things fun. Now, I had a coach tell me not long ago, hold it, this is rep basketball, it's not about fun. Under 12 girls. He's right, rep basketball, 10, 11-year-old girls. My daughter's nine, she plays with dolls. I'm going to go and she's going to play for that guy a year later where it's not about fun, not a chance in hell. All right? So what have you done to make practice fun? Any examples? Not to put you on the spot. What's some examples that in the slog of a, of a season that you've, you've done in your pro career? Yep.
kids love that, especially the younger. They 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 love it. They, you know. Now, do you do that for an hour? No. We're not. This isn't about you know getting the, everything's an Aussie hoop session. But that's an investment, and you know. It's a demonstration by you to the players and their families that, that you get it, that, that it's not as, you know, under 12 girls is not that cutthroat. We do want it to be fun, right? So those things are, are really important. What, one of mine is play knuckleball. End of, you know, we always scrimmage at the end of sessions. And yeah, well, we, you get into scrimmage. And coaches think that's a reward for the players. Well, we're gonna scrimmage now. Well, you can scrimmage now. But often, scrimmages are really demanding and it's hard and there's stress and they've got to execute all this thing. And the coach is saying, we've got to put things in place. We just did a practice. No good just playing. So all of a sudden, you're thinking, oh, well, I'm going to let them scrimmage. They think, God. So I'll let them scrimmage, but they, they've got to use their knuckles. They can't use their palms or fingers to do any skill. Dribble, pass, catch, shoot. All right. We've had WNBL girls giggling like Aussie Hoopers playing that game and at the end of practice asking if they can play that game. Right? So you've got to find ways to get that, get that done. Be an educator. Sleep has been, has been identified as one of the massive issues in well-being, both in terms of your physical well-being, your athletic performance, your cognitive skills, a whole lot of things. What impacts, what impacts sleep in young people right now? What are some things that impact the quality of sleep that young people have? Technology, right? Why does, do we know why that, that impacts specifically sleep? The blue light, backlit devices, right? And I, you know, I'm going on my Griffith High School year 10 science now, so please don't, but backlit devices, they they trigger a chemical in your brain basically to say it's daytime. That's a very, very layman's way of doing it. But, you know, if you do any sort of Google search, they say watching a backlit device within an hour of trying to go to sleep is actually counterintuitive. What's the other really significant backlit, backlit device in our world? Television. That's why I say televisions in, in um, bedrooms are diabolical for the quality of sleep. Right. What's the last thing you do before you go to bed? Check your mentions. It's the first thing you do in the morning. You wake up. Check your email. Pretty common, right? But so kids have to know why. They have to know why that that is an issue. Nutrition, when they're eating, what they're eating, all these things. And I had someone say to me, "That's the job of the parents." Yeah, yeah, you're right. But you can help because you're coaching them in an athletic environment. Your main dealing with them is in an athletic environment. So you give them information about the athletic environment. Their parents will parent them on everything else. Parents have got a pretty big job. We're the experts in the athletic area, right? So, and then tournaments. I, I just saw uh, Melbourne Storm, and I know this is not a rugby league uh, town. Melbourne Storm, for those that don't know, are the gold standard. They're the Perth Wildcats of the NRL. They win every year or every second year. They're in the grand final. Their coach, Craig Bellamy, is probably the best rugby league coach ever. They take their phones off them on game day. So they have a breakfast. They take their phones off them. All right? One, um, it's about them being connected and engaged. That was the primary, primary thing. Two, there's some science about stimulus. You know, so if they're looking at, at really active apps or things at 10 o'clock and they don't play till 5 o'clock, the brain's working too hard and then there's an integrity part of it so they can't put $50 each way on the fifth at Camden. Right? Interesting thing to do, all right? You may not be able to do that, but we certainly can educate them about how that's going to impact their well-being. Demonstrate your value in holistic uh, well-being. How can you demonstrate your value to the players and the coaches? What's something that you can do that shows, that, that demonstrates clearly that you value their well-being above everything else? Real simple, not a trick question. 
middle of the season, they're fatigued, they're tired, you've got some niggling injuries, it's cold, what can you do? Don't have training. What? We only get two sessions a week for 32 weeks to play 12 games. Again, say it out loud to yourself. Dave grew up in Melbourne. How many weeks a year they play rep basketball in Melbourne? About Literally, about 42, 44 weeks a year they play rep basketball. Play, competition. I remember coaching a game on the 20th of December, rep game, 20th of December. All right? Um, and we didn't train for two weeks before that last game. I said, this is just crazy. We have to play because they say that well, we don't have to train. All right? Where, where I was coaching was right by the beach. All kids wanted to do after, after school is go to the beach. So we didn't train for two weeks. We got beat one of those games too. I mean, it's ridiculous. All right? So just... Again, say stuff out loud to yourself and just de do things that demonstrate the well-being. Yeah, and then we've all done, go 10-pin bowling or whatever else. But I would say this about, sometimes coaches will go to the pool or they'll go 10-pin bowling or, or whatever else to keep it fresh. What would really keep it fresh? Say you want to you offload the players, right? You want to, you know free their mind, you want them not to focus on basketball. So you could take them bowling or you could take them. What would really, really be effective? Yeah, don't have training. <laughs> All right? I'm sure there's other athletes in the room, so I won't keep referring to Greg. Sometimes the coach says, OK, we're not going to train Thursday, and inside you're like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. We're going to go bowling. Oh, that's good, coach. So what have you got to do? You still got to get in the car. You got to drive. To, you're still doing something else. So sometimes that doing something else can just be, hey, stay home. Everyone, everyone, stay home. Now the problem will be, if you give them a night off, what will happen? Remember, remember that example, of the guy with seven coaches. You give them a night off, what will happen? Some imbecile will fill it up. I say this all the time. You can't legislate against imbeciles. Right? You're doing your part and, and you go from there. All right. WWW, we all think World Wide Web. Well, it's also a great tool for leaders, coaches, managers, whatever else. When we talk about stresses, Young players, young people have got a lot of different stresses. They've got school, they've got performance in terms of their sporting thing, they've got uh, expectations in terms of their academic uh, record, you know, what are they going to go to university, they're going to get a decent job, da 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 da. How do we motivate pe young people often, especially in the academic world as parents? Through fear. If you don't study, you won't get a good job. Right? I, and I, I hope there's no one that does this trade in the room, but my father's a school principal. He said, you don't study, you'll be a garbage man. That was his motivation for me to study, all right? So, didn't work out here, I'm a ba failed basketball coach. Right? But ask your players what went well today. It's a big one. This is from the NRL. A friend of mine works in the welfare space of the NRL. They invented this welfare role at the club. They'd never had one. And he said, what do you want me to do? And they said, we've got no idea. The NRL told us we need to have this position. Figure it out. He said, beauty. So he had 42 players on the list. He brought them all in one by one, said, what went well today? 64% of people said, nothing. Young men getting three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year to play sport for a living. More than more than half, nearly two thirds, said nothing went well today. He goes, went back to the club, said I need more money. Right? 
No one had a clue. No one had a clue about these young men and how that they were feeling and whatever else. So they implemented a whole strategy. What went well today? Help explore the positives. It, it's a key strategy and allow players to have positive self-talk and dialogue. It got to a stage where players would come up to this guy and they'd say, Phil, I took my missus out for breakfast this morning. It's fantastic. And they'd just walk off. It went from two-thirds of them not being able to give one, one single thing that what went well to guys just walking up out of the blue, these big, buffy NRL players sharing that they had smashed Avo at some fancy cafe with the missus. He said, success. Now, that's a very simple thing, but who's coached a team that's been beaten every game? Right? It's really hard, is it? What's some strategies you did to keep them interested, to keep them positive, to keep them motivated? What's some things that you did? Yep. Yep. What sort of metrics? Uh, uh, hustle. Yep. Uh, rebound. Uh, yep. Personal metrics. Yep. Um, for the right individual, it's, it's limitless what you can do. Yep. Like GPI, uh, focus off winning. Yep. But at the same time, they're, they're humans and humans like to win. Um, yeah, yeah. Yep. If, if you think you've got to frame what's success, they can still win. They still have success. You've just got to frame it. And winning's not a dirty word either. This is not an Aussie Hoops lecture. You know, it's okay to compete, but someone's going to come last. Coach, did you have something? Uh, yeah, Dyson, what was your best moment today? Yeah, similar. Similar. What went well today? They're the winningest, winningest franchise in Australian sport. They have stresses. So at some stage, someone's going to have to say, what went well today? You know, cricket, they talk about people being out of form. I don't know if you know, but in America, they don't use that term. And it's always, oh, nothing, he's just out of form, or he's in really good form. But they don't talk about that. You're either a good player or a bad player in the States. Right? You're either played well or you didn't. Form small. You, you know. So... If someone's convinced that they're in poor form, how do you get it? You've got to frame this. All right? You've got to frame this. So what I want you to think about an athlete that you've dealt with in the last two years that you think this could have helped with their confidence, right? with their self-belief, and in essence, their well-being. Write their name down. Or, if you can't think of one, that think about how you can implement this strategy in your coaching. Now, it doesn't have to be what went well. It's just nice because it's www and I found something in the net, so it's great. Right? But it, what is it? It's a question. That's what coaching is now. Modern coaching is a series of questions. It's not a series of statements. 
It's not a series of instructions. It's a series of questions. Because people feel part of that. They feel valued. They feel safe. They feel, God, this guy's corny. But this is true. This is what does it. Conversations. What I'm doing right now to you is the least most effective way of educating and it's the least efficient way of you learning. Lecture style presentations. Hierarchical. I'm standing, you're sitting. I'm talking, you're listening. It is. Right? So, one, I'm a fool for doing it. But two, if we're talking about coaching, why would we do that? Asking questions is really, really important. And that, again, it's not all about the welfare piece. You hear it all the time. Time out, pro game, they come in, coach goes, what do you think we should go to? And one of the leaders go, hey, we've got a red special. And the coach goes, we're good with that. Get the affirmation, let's go red special. Right? It's a real powerful moment. Now, does the player want you to do that in every time out? Of course they don't. They want leadership, they want direction. Right? But sometimes just asking a question at the most stressful time is a great diffuser, but it's also a great way to exhibit trust and care. Right? I trust your opinion, right? and I care, I care about all of you to say we're going to go with that. It's a really, really powerful tool. This is the most common thing, and, and I'd be interested, Greg, as you are, as you, are, you know, far more articulate and far more researched than I. The pushback we have when we've presented this, and I think this is the fifth or sixth time I've presented, is that, and that's a quote from three, three or four coaches minimum. But I'm not an expert. I'm not a healthcare professional. Is that something that you get in, in your field a little bit? Yeah, you know? sure. And it's not overt pushback. It's not people saying, hey, I don't give a shit about that. Right? It's conservative and it's unsure and whatever else, and it's a great place to hide. Well, if we're talking about the welfare of young athletes, do we want to be involved or do we want to be hiding? So we know you're not an expert. We know that we don't expect you to be unless there is any healthcare professionals in the room. All right? I did this in Cairns about five weeks ago and there was a clinical psychologist uh, in the room and I coached him as a kid. And I didn't know what, what he was and what he would come as an adult. And he came up after me, he goes, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, yeah, no, I do. And I said, what do you mean? I said his name. He goes, that was great. But, uh, oh, what do you do now? You know, I think Garbage man. He goes, I'm a clinical psychologist for North Queensland Health. And I got embarrassed. Straight away got embarrassed and I started to just, oh, look, mate, I wasn't, you know, like, yes, what's wrong with you? Because we said, what's wrong with you? Uh, nothing, mate, but I, just, I don't want you to feel, you know. He goes, shut up, man. So that was great. That was great. Did you think about this? Did you think about this? And we had a conversation. That was really cool. But it was really great for me because here's me saying you can't do that. And the first thing when I felt challenged about my knowledge base was to defend. All right. So if you're not sure, refer family, club administrators, healthcare professionals, of course. Follow up is a big one. This is a big, big one, in, in, and we face this all the time at the Centre of Excellence. There's an issue. It's dealt with and then you park it. Follow-up is king. Follow-up phone calls, follow-up conversations, ringing mum. Hey, Mrs Crawford, um, had a conversation with Keegan on Tuesday about a couple of things. I thought it went really well. Uh, how's he been this week? You know, again, what's the worst thing that can happen? No, but don't just go, oh, dealt with that one. Follow up is, is king. Be proactive and you're aware of a potential issue. Research, there's plenty of online resources and, and conversations now. Um, 
Now, uh, I had a slide after this one with all the different groups, but there were so many that it was just cluttered, which is really cool. You know, um, so you know, do your research on it. This is one that is a challenge. Confidentiality is important, but it so is the welfare of the child in your care. This is the other thing that a lot of coaches, and I use this in inverted commas, hide behind confidentiality. It's none of my business. I'm overstepping the mark. That's an easy, easy out for you. In fact, I'm doing the right thing. I'm not crying. I'm not dealt with it. It's none of my business. It's the family. It's not my place. Can I justify that in my own? Yep. Is that all fair enough? No. All right. So yes, confidentiality. I think any you know, uh, adult with common sense is going to understand the need to be circumspect, the need to keep the loop small, right? The, the need for confidentiality and privacy. But that shouldn't supersede acting if you've got a concern. Right? Who's had a situation where they make and even, of course, no names or any specific. Who's had a situation where you have delved into the welfare or the well-being of one of your players and got pushed back from the family? Has anyone? Has that happened to anyone? What was your response? Again, be very broad. But how did you how did you manage it? If you don't mind me asking. Um, how did you first up? I just I just sort of said, well, if there is a time that you want to discuss your verbals with me, I'm available. And occasionally to touch base. To see if there was a change in their sort of stance in if it's acceptable or not to discuss with them. That's about it. And that's the follow up piece. Because you know what? When you reach out and you get that response, there's a little part of you saying, Whew. What to do with that? What was your experience? Um, basically, I mean, I'm in mental health well being. Yep. I mean, that is one of my big specialties, but um, my having come from Saturday going into the um, basically it's just people not aware of the of a player, of what you know, their conditions, how they are, coaches not really trying to learn about those conditions, therefore child comes away, the child's not playing. So that's that's quite a um, it's a little bit more technical but so important finding out about a child, following up, don't just leave it because it builds up. Yeah. Um, so um, just watching it all happen has helped me learn a lot about how to yeah. deal with even the threats or whatever. Yeah. Good. Anyone help in that situation talking about that, but yeah. Yeah. No, so it, again, it's it. just been, it's being brave, it's a bit courageous because, you know, you know what, we're a conservative Anglo-Saxon uh, culture by, by nature, you know, we're multicultural and whatever else, but our core is that of being conservative, stiff up a lip, all that stuff, right? Mind your own business, you know? All those things that underpin society, you know? Well, they're counterproductive in this setting. It doesn't mean that you become a, the old-fashioned sticky beast. But certainly being brave enough to have the conversation and ask questions and put yourself in an environment. One of the other big um, strengths of really good coaches in the modern era is vulnerability. Is being vulnerable. The, the days of the coach that's the, the, the rock and the, nothing affects them, and they're gone. You know, um, if you look at, at uh, Andre, uh, when he spoke. Andre Lamarmas, when he spoke earlier in the week about having the cup players, he, he choked up. When he spoke earlier in the season about uh, Mika Bacona's injury, he, he, he literally was in tears. And, you know, other than the very odd imbecile, everyone was glowing in, well, how cool is that? Not one, not one person with a brain said, I can't believe it. Right? And the players, you know, if I'm a player, I'm like, well, that's genuine tears. It's genuine affection and, and, and whatever else. So it, it is it is important. Um, and 
I can only reflect on what how I've changed. I now reach out every single time one of my former players have had for a period of time achieved something. I reach out to say, great job, well done on your retirement, well done on this, well done on that, I'm really proud of you. I use that all the time. Right? And it doesn't make me a saint, but I'll, there's no way 10 years ago I would have ever uttered those words, ever uttered those words. Weakness, whatever. But now, I sometimes think, oh, I might come across a little bit ingenuine now because I do it, do it so often, every time. That, but, you know, it, it's something that, that I enjoy doing and I think that they enjoy that part of the relationship. It doesn't mean that we're these long lost friends, but there's a genuine affection there and hopefully you're having an impact on their, their world learning. And again, modern coaching always comes back to more conversations. I challenge you to have more conversations with your players. And while you're sitting there, mentally rehearsing the reasons that you can't. We're busy. We only train once a week. I've got a family. I work 70 hours a week in an accounting firm. I get it, I get it, I get it. So I said, I don't have a real job. I'm lucky. I know you guys do. But it's no excuse not to have more conversation. And that's what will underpin all of this. Right, the ability to have that conversation. 